So welcome everybody to the panel on the best teaching practices. My name is Dagmara Sokolska and I teach at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. So actually it's quite late here uh, right now. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all who took the time to watch our presentations on the topic and who posted the questions and the remarks or perusal. It was a pretty vivid conversation, especially uh, today in the evening, almost, I mean, in the evening for me. So, so just before the, the third day started. So make sure that you see all the answers given by our presenters, okay? Uh, best teaching practices, as Eric already said, was the most populated topic uh, of the post summer conference in terms of uh, the presentation. So that is why we have today's seven panelists. We will start with a short introduction by each of them. You will have um, any questions uh, to the panelists. Yes, please raise your hand during this introductory part because it will be easier uh, and better for the flow of the discussion, but easier also for ma the management uh, for, of the uh, panel if you just raise your hand as, as uh, in the previous uh, um, session. But of course, the chat is also available. We can see that it is uh, very vivid and please add there your comments and reactions. Uh, we will try to cope with this uh, two panel streams uh, of your thoughts and uh, uh, just to to pick up also the, the your thoughts from the panel. So we have a pretty international group of teachers and academics developing, implementing, and uh, doing new teaching learning strategies. So I'm happy to meet today Michael Lerner from Ohio, Fabian Kunis from Bulgaria, Elmarie Mortimer from Florida, Shannon Moray from Massachusetts, uh, Helen Reynolds from Arizona, but also representing the UK a bit, and Nancy Rosicki from University of uh, Florida with her team, Krista Dolany and Lorelei Imperial, and Jasmina Lazendik Galloway from Netherlands, but I, I, uh, I just realized that maybe beforehand you were in Australia, so you represent Australia as well. Okay, so we will start with this short introductory remarks and then introduction of a person. So we will start with Michael Lerner, who showed us a brilliant idea of how to make it easier to transfer from a novice to an expert teacher. So Michael, could you introduce yourself and give a few introductory remarks on today's topics, please? Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Michael Lerner. I teach uh, all the AP physics classes uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I'm in my like 25th year of teaching. And this talk for me was just me trying to explore what I feel was my transformation from a novice to an expert teacher. And I found that it was about lesson planning for me. And uh, I, when I first started teaching at the American School of Warsaw in Poland in 1994 with no educational experience, um, I was just worried about filling in the time. And I feel that more and more layers get in there. And I feel that those layers we heard today in the talk, uh, they become about the moves. What does each minute look like with your students? And knowing what the uh, overarching goals are for your class, which I call the storyline, like what order you want to teach things in and sort of what story you want students to tell themselves. Uh, and I feel like I heard a lot of that in um, the talk we just heard. Yeah, that is right. Uh, and I posted even uh, a kind of a remark to your, uh, to your lecture, to your presentation about lesson plans, which is a nightmare of our pre-service to, uh, teachers in Poland. So anyway, yeah. uh, now we go to Fabian Kunis, who is from Bulgaria and knows all the tricks about collaborative learning. Actually, he must because he is a PhD student and prepares a master thesis on this topic. So Fabian, the floor is uh, yours. Yes, thank you, Dagmar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Fabian Kunis and I'm a PhD student at the University of uh, Sofia, St. Clement Okritsky. And I'm also a teacher at Brian Penev High School in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, I teach physics from seven to 12th grade. And uh, for me, it's a great honor to participate in this great um, webinar. Uh, 
So I would like to thank Professor Mazur, Krastan Bogoyev, uh, Sarah, uh, Izara for making this possible. And uh, my talk is about how to engage students in uh, collaborative learning. I've talked about the um, benefits of collaborative learning, also challenges of collaborative learning, uh, also implementing peer instruction in Jigsaw based on my experience as a teacher. And I think that's that's probably all for my talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you, yeah. Degmara. Thank you. Yes, I, I could see that you uh, combine all these active methods just to explore probably what's the best for your students. Okay, we have also Elmarie Mortimer, a science fiction fan who wants her high school students to see kitties and cradles instead of a bunch of X's. And it seems that she found a missing plug for that. So Elmarie? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mara. Hi, I'm Elmarie Mortimer. I teach at a, a Trinity Preparatory School here in Winter Park, Florida. Um, and maybe the piece of the puzzle that I have to say immediately is that we are a liberal arts school. And um, this year, pandemic allowed me uh, to actually start speaking in my fellow teachers in the other subjects, um, classrooms. And just what are they doing? Uh, sort of the question is how do the language teachers, how are they successful teaching uh, the kids to write good writing and the math for math? And um, this, so when the opportunity came along where they said, well, let's start doing this single summer reading book and then spotlight it from different disciplines. Um, I had to be in on it. I, I love this idea that a piece of knowledge um, is, is, there's different ways of looking at it. And the only way that you can understand the whole piece is by looking right. at hey, it from you. different yeah. directions. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, so, uh, is this the for that? Okay. Somebody's microphone is on. Uh, Eric. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, so to spotlight it from different areas, and I, I think that also comes back for me to my best teaching practices is that, um, and, and Michael used the word move, I, li I like the word move. Um, I have a, a couple of moves in my, on my desk, and depending on the situation, I might grab one here or I might grab one there, but being able to maneuver between all these moves for me is, is helps. Um, all the different students in my classroom. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we go to Shannon Moray, who is crazy about making sense of patterns in physics learning and gave us an access to the pattern approach. So Shannon. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so I'm a physics um, teacher at Abbott Lawrence Academy, which is a public exam school in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And I just wrapped up my seventh year teaching. Um, I teach mostly ninth grade physics, but also AP physics and this year environmental science. <laughs> um, and as um, you noted, my talk was about the patterns approach and uh, patterns really focuses on students developing understanding through inquiry and projects-based learning. A lot of people noted in the questions that it was very similar to modeling and there are many many pieces from modeling curriculum in the patterns curriculum um, it is directly aligned to the next generation science standards uh, and it also has a really strong focus on computational thinking which we do not interpret as just equation manipulation but you know really students developing kind of some basic coding skills in google sheets uh, and then i think uniquely each unit has an engineering design challenge that, that really drives learning um, and so i found it very beneficial for my students and i'm um, excited to talk about it thank you so much and we are, I'm very happy that we had so many teachers that just justified, uh, they, they just show their work and uh, from their own experience and uh, teaching practice. So Nancy Ruzeki and her team, Krista and Rolai, uh, who equipped us with a framework enhancing class instruction through professional development. Could you say anything? Yeah, and I, I apologize. My my university occasionally blocks my camera, so we're being blocked right now. But I, I really appreciate the chance to present our work. And um, so I'm actually a, a teacher as well as a professor. I have a education degree, uh, was one of my first degrees. And then I have a PhD in physics and I have taught uh, school at all levels. I've taught in a lot of inner city schools, notably New Orleans, and in uh, inner city Seattle. 
Um, and so I've taught physics on the ground uh, to students of all ability levels and also computer programming. And so when I went to the university, one of the things I thought about the most is how do we support teachers on the ground in best practices. And so we have a $5 million grant from the Department of Education to provide professional development to teachers for things like system thinking, uh, modeling instructional practices, computational thinking, and the use of technology. And, and this is something that we really like uh, to talk to you more about is how technology can really help students build out core concept models in physics. Um, and do it quickly so that you have more time for discussion and it lends itself to flipped classrooms. So we invite and encourage you to take a look at our materials and our website. Thank you very much. And I would like to welcome Helen Reynolds using cognitive science in the physics classroom. Helen. Hi, everybody. Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have, I have been here before, but this is my total passion. I absolutely love this. So just a little bit of background that um, I did teach in the UK for 22 years in the same school. It's my 32nd year of teaching. Um, I love the fact that I love this, listening to you, Michael, about the journey you take as a teacher and how reflecting on that is just such an important part of the piece and so exciting and why I just still love teaching so much. But um, what's been interesting about cognitive science, which I've, has been very big in the UK, huge, I mean, massive conferences, free conferences for teachers to attend, research ed, recommend it on uh, YouTube and stuff if you haven't seen it. Tons of brilliant books. But what it's meant for me is that it's an additional thing for me to think about. And we were talking about why physics. And I think one of the most powerful things about CogSci is it, it really helps you to reflect on why, why is this happening in this room right now, in this way, with me essentially mm -hmm. doing the organization all same. So it's meant that things are deliberate, and I think that the critical, there's so many critical things like, oh, just, I was trying to make a list. I can't like reduce it. Um, without a model of, uh, in your head, without a model of how students learn, instruction is blind. Dylan William, the guy who wrote the thing about inside the black box and formed the assessment. Understanding how students learn is like absolutely critical, which changes how you think about it. So understanding the map of the territory, come with me, child, let me show you how this amazing world of physics works. Um, in terms of learning physics in the classroom, I don't come from a, a background of lecturing. Lecturing is not something I've ever done. So it's always been hands-on do things. So I'm pitching into the cognitive thing with that as the, as the thing that, that really happens every day. And the thing that, that students say is, I didn't think I could do it. Now I understand that how I'm learning this can be applied to various things and they're just excited that they can do physics. Success breeds motivation, not the other way around. Thank you so much. I must say that I really, really enjoyed your presentation and I learned a lot. It was so much revealing to me. So, and last but not least, Yasmina Lazendik-Galloway, uh, with whom we circle back to the novice uh, versus experts. Uh, from we started uh, um, from novice and experts uh, with Michael, and um, so we circle back to this issue and development of metacognition and physics. So Yasmina, could you hi say everyone. A word? Uh, well, I'm I'm a mathematician with a PhD in astrophysics. So I worked as astrophysicist and I taught at uh, Monash University for a very long time, which was in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I taught mostly physics to non-physicists, so engineers, um, bio, bio uh, students, and so somebody who needed to be convinced that physics is worth knowing. Um, but also because I'm a mathematician from undergraduate, uh, and then you know discovered, you know, like for many mathematicians, for me physics was just applied maths, right? Um, in high school, but it's really when I went into astrophysics and I realized what knowledge physics brings and what way of thinking uh, physics brings, it really made me think differently than my colleague physicists. They take things for granted, I noticed that, and they expect when they say something, everybody will just get so um, excited, but you have to, to, to a regular person, you know, to a student, you have to actually help them sometimes see that because maybe you have 10% of students who are super excited about physics, and others need convincing, um, with, they need to need, see reason why physics matters. So um, as I moved to this active learning and flipped classroom and all of that kind of um, good stuff, 
one thing that was kind of lagging behind was assessment. And as Eric always says, assessment is the painful point for, for, for many reasons, because you're torn between what, would you what you would like and what a system requires you to do. So I found a way to um, have this process, this invisible process of how do we do inference? And we, we talked about it yesterday, a lot about that, I think. How do students make these conclusions from the data they have and how do they you know, have sanity check whether the, the inference they made, does it make sense or not? So I found a way to you know, have across 300 students and having um, several TAs, I found a method to have a sort of a consistent way of monitoring that, but also to, uh, as somebody commented on the video um, at, the, at the platform, it really brings back um, ownership of the learning process of the student. And so that's the biggest reward to see. The students really feel like uh, we reward them for mastering the knowledge, you know, going from novice to experts, rather than constantly punishing them for what they don't know. So very happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I do not see any hands up. So I will check, but not, not really. Okay, and the chat is still about the uh, lecture, we just, uh, uh, the keynote we just uh, show, uh, saw. So um, maybe we, I will start, okay, Mark, Mark Suda, please. Hi, so a couple of quick questions. Um, you talked about the idea of moving from, like giving a student a bad grade, right? Which seems more like I'm punishing you for what you don't know to actually giving them these chances to show mastery becoming a way in which to increase that idea of like, I'm rewarding you, right? There's this difference between punishing versus rewarding, right? Um, but do you feel like if, and, and this is something we've talked about often, right? And I agree, let me just start with, I agree with that being a large part of how to teach, right? But do you think that sometimes it could become like if we are giving these students multiple opportunities or multiple um, just chances, chances, opportunities or um, products to choose from, right? Could it result in students always taking the easy way out, right? What I mean by that is I don't want to put in the extra effort, so I'm going to do the assignment that's easiest for me to get that 80%, right? Or I know I'm going to get 10 chances so on that first one, I don't even want to try. Um, if so, you face a situation like that, then what would you do? So, so that's a great question. And I think uh, saying what John said at the beginning of his keynote, um, just because you're pushing for mastery doesn't mean it's easier. It just means the student can choose a level. So uh, because I teach at the university level, um, I, and, and this is, these, these courses normally that I teach, they're not elective, students have to take them as a part, but they're not part of their major, they're just additional courses they have to take. Um, I was very enthusiastic at start and I was you know, always checking who is falling behind, emailing them, sending them extra resources, videos, offering for, you know one-on-one. -on -one. And students are just overwhelmed. They have something else going on in their lives, for example. So um, now I, at the beginning of class, I would ask them, what is your preferred level? You know, do you want 50%? Do you want 60%? What do you want? And then I'll push you to that level. And so this is where mastery also allows me. So if, if I say you have demonstrated, so my levels are very simple, not demonstrated, developing, demonstrated, and mastered. And the reason is that if you tell students everything you want, you give them beautiful rubric, you explain everything you want, they will produce to that. Good students will produce to that. But sometimes there will be students who will just come and blow your mind, right? They would write this piece and explain all this, and you still have to give them same mark, let's say, you know, 10 out of 10. But they have actually demonstrated much broader understanding of the concepts. So they really moved to be an expert learner. So this is why, and, and somebody again, uh, Michelle, uh, somebody made a comment in a video saying, how do you convert this learning for mastery to a traditional mark? Well, the system does, you know, I use Moodle as a learning management system. And although the student sees that as a drop down menu of demonstrated learning, Moodle just converts it to zero, one, two, three, four. And, you know, if, if there's a four or five, these um, learning outcomes, student will see description of each at what level, and there will be some mark underneath. 
But really what it changes is they, they didn't come to me and say, why did I lose this mark? You know, why did I lose this one mark? I want this mark back. My, my, you know, my friend had exactly the same answer and he got, you know, full mark and I lost mark. Why? And so it, it, it's more of, and, and I don't blame them because we signal that that's important. We signal the marks are important. We, we celebrate high achieving students. And so then, of course, they're going to fight for each of these marks, especially something like labs and practical work, which they can control, right? Tests, they can't. So what this mood, and I, was, I didn't really plan this. I just wanted to signal to them that every level of knowledge is fine if that's where you want to stop. And what I didn't mention in the video is that I actually have two times in a semester, I ask them to reflect and say, are you happy with your progress? And if you're not, why are you not happy and what are you going to do about it? And then underneath, what resources can I help you with to, to achieve that? And so that's that thing where, you know, there's, you have to pass the unit and, and to pass is a lot of work. But then every other step is up to your abilities and up to your current status, right? Um, and so this is, I think, something we talked yesterday about this accessible learning and, and education. So uh, I'm, I'm completely about for, the, for education in which everybody gets everything but they don't have to excel in everything. But you can have a student in fifth grade who struggles with maths and something happens in eighth grade and all of a sudden they're great. And so you should always have these learning opportunities, but you shouldn't always strive for 10 out of 10. And as long as student can demonstrate that knowledge to you, you kind of go, okay, you have done the basics. And, and what we mentioned earlier, what John mentioned earlier, uh, how did you call it, John? You have um, essentials and need, to, uh, need to, uh, good to know. So this is what this mastery uh, idea is for. So that you yeah, have think, those basics, yeah. Yeah, and I think mastery can look a lot of different ways. So for example, both when I taught high school and when I teach at the university, students have choice exams. And so in a choice exam, they can pick and choose problems they want to solve. And there's a variety of problems at different levels that are worth different amounts of points. So if you're, uh, there's set questions that everyone has to answer, and then they have choice questions that they get to pick from. And so a student that is an advanced student can do more difficult problems and do less of them to get to their points, where a student who's just a novice can do more sort of conceptual questions and still achieve the same goal of understanding, but just in their own way. And you have to organize what you're giving students in order for them to be able to show you what they know. And so a choice test also lets me know the level that my students are operating at. Um, and that helps me understand how to make adjustments to my instruction. Additionally, within the laboratory, we have lab reports that have a first draft and a second draft. And I don't think we do students any service by having them think that the world is completed in a one hour class or a two hour class, that everything is this discrete bit of knowledge that just goes away when you're done for the day. And so students have to understand how to redo their work because when they go out in the workforce or they, heaven forbid, they go to graduate school and somebody says to them, I'm sorry, this product is unacceptable. You need to go back and redo it. They need to have the skills to be able to assess their own work, right? Because not everyone is gonna be there to judge them in their work forever. And, and that's why in, in my, in my uh, approach, I really try to focus on that second step, which is for them to assess their own knowledge in respect to the exemplar. Uh, because you know, in, a, in a classroom with 250 students, uh, where, where I have 40 A's or you know, at the time with 100 students, it's very difficult to get one-on-one -on -one feedback. And as John said, that's what's shown to be the best you know, way to learn. So by, by students having to reflect on the example and saying, oh, I realized this is where I made mistake and, and things like that. If we realize that they see without our help, just by showing them example, if they can see where they made mistakes, then uh, th that basically demonstrated that learning. And so that's why they can have you know, extra marks from realizing where they made mistake because once they realize that themselves, they won't forget it. But if we have marked their work off and you know crossed and, and gave zero, they would just remember, oh, you know, they marked me down. And mm -hmm. I, I understand this is university students, so they have slightly different attitude. But you can apply that because I work a lot with high schools and I see that you know the, the physics is taught in quite traditional way. 
and you know it was emphasis is on equations 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 and you ask them how would you estimate you know the speed of ball falling down and they say well show me show me the equation and i'll tell you and i said no 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 but you have, from my words you have to and what i find is basically i have to relearn my students when they come after year 11 and 12 which is quite intensive in australia and it's all about you know teaching to passing the tests i have to then relearn them how to read the questions postulate and this is again eric's work you know when he gave a talk in australia many years back that motivated me the way how he approached that having the clear four steps of problem solving so uh, and then after about you know two weeks students say oh my god this is like you know grade eight again it's exciting it's cool science you know i get to think not just do equations and tests so it's it, it, it kind of it's university uh, education but almost kind of going back to the school education right and so I think it's it's probably system that my work for year 11 and 12, um, just because now year, year 11 and 12 tends to prepare students for university, but university is going backwards, university is going flipped and active. So, you know, somebody posted that, that question in the chat as well. If, if, you know, if teachers are saying we need to teach this because that's how you're going to sit in the lectures and you could be in university, we're actually going other way around. So they sh they, we should feed from each other in that respect. Okay, thank you. I believe yeah, yeah. Helen would like to add something, and then El Marie. Right. Well, no, it's re it's really interesting. I think one of the the things that's coming out is that people feel um, that students having choice is um, is important, and I just wanted to to sort of say, can we like dig deep on that a little bit? Because uh, I think it really depends on what what it is that you're trying to achieve. So if you have the the, the start with the goal in mind of your understanding, your schema. I've moved into thinking not about knowledge and skills, but schema. So what is the schema we would like these students to have? A lot of students aren't gonna necessarily choose those things that we would like and we need for them to be able to do because you know they're hard and whatever. And it speaks to what Masuda, Masuda was saying earlier. Um, so there's that part. And also, <laughs> um, sorry, John, flip learning is A, type of active learning not the only type of active learning that i mean active learning is also something perhaps to dig deep on and think what are, how does that manifest in a classroom because flipped is one way of doing it and there are others in order to get the minds on what you think about is what you learn is another big cog sci message um so your attention is the most important thing in a lesson but it was really those two things student choice you know, and what does active learning mean? I think that those two questions are really interesting to tease out in a forum like this with all these people with so many brilliant ideas. Okay, Elmarie, and then we have a question from John Masuk, who is waiting uh, for a long time. So. I, I'm gonna try and keep my comment very, very short. Um, if you feed, if, you, if your whole thing is grades and you feed the students the grades, they want the grades back. So um, what I actually tried to do for the last two years is in the first month, and the administration is not always very happy with me, but they wonderful if it's in the end, if they see the end result of it. For the first month, nothing goes in the grade book because nobody knows anything about physics. Anyway, we're going to do it for that sheer joy, that dopamine. <laughs> I, um, and I, after I listened to the talk yesterday, I sort of started understanding that Students start doing stuff because they enjoy doing it. Um, a lot of this gamification, um, making different groups, and it helps him build a collaborative um, classroom as well. But just competing against each other, the end result is nothing but, hey, I won today. Tomorrow I'm going to be, the, the next group is going to be uh, you. And that, that helps take the stress away from grades, grades, grades the whole time. At the same time, I need to bring in grades because in the end, my job depends on how my students do on the AP exam. So I cannot ignore not teaching to the test. So at the moment, my approach is a little bit of, of combining everything in the sense that, yes, I do teach to the test, but I also try and bring in another um, things um, on the sideline that makes it nice to do physics, not necessarily physics just for the sake of a grade. Thank you, John Masuk. Uh, yes, thank you. It's uh, so strange to have a complete stranger pronounce my name correctly on the very first try. <laughs> but then you're from right next door where it came from, so. 
probably <laughs> that's why <laughs> okay. interesting i'm so used to just correcting people <laughs> <laughs> i can't imagine okay anyway <laughs> I, I it's been great to hear all these different uh views because it reinforces that I actually am on the right track, that I'm doing the right things. I'm doing bits and pieces of all of it, um, which is fantastic. Great relief. But I have two big issues that I'm struggling with um, as far as standards-based learning and grading. Uh, one, my students are still grade crazy, um, always trying to get the A, figuring out how to get the A, um, and, and rather than learning from when I give them anything less than an A. You know, my, one of my most frequent questions to them is when they ask me why they didn't get an A, did you read my comments? <laughs> and their answer invariably is no. <laughs> so, um, I need, I'd like to know strategies, something that I haven't already tried, to take their focus away from getting the A, 90%, whatever. I've, I'm trying to move away, move them away from that mindset. The other thing is I use, I don't know how many people here are familiar with it. I use the Power School grade book system, my the whole school district does. And at least at the moment, we're stuck with numerical grades. So no matter how much standard-based grading I do in the class, when I'm putting stuff on the report card or in the gradebook, rather, I have to put in a grade, a percentage. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody, I haven't yet learned the power school way of doing that truly standards based. It's one of my professional development goals. In the meantime, I need a hybrid that will clearly communicate to the kids that this is not a punishment percentage. This is my standards based stuff translated into percentage speak <laughs> okay so do you have any question or it was just a remark and you wanted to share with us no i can try to answer some yeah. of that i had okay. the same sort of problem um one of the things is uh the one of the moves that i made was i just didn't give them grades on their piece of paper um they just didn't exist and i actually for a while didn't put anything in a grade book i, I recorded it but I didn't put it on there. And there is something to be said. I don't remember what paper I read about this, but I do remember this paper in graduate school about if you give a kid a paper with a grade on it, the first thing they do is look, they look at your the grade. And the second thing is they look at another student's grade on the same paper. Like they never look at your comments if they're, so I just don't write grades on papers anymore. I don't even tell them if they did a good job or a bad job on a question. I just put comments. And then those comments can go into something else on some other piece of paper that I give them later. So that's a move that I did to try to like de-emphasize grades. And uh, the other thing is I kept repeating the message that the, the grade that's in the grade book, which I made it so that I was lucky enough to make it so it did never display the percentage at, at the end. So they could see that they did well and poorly on standards, but they couldn't tell what that turned into a grade. Uh, I just said, like, this is just where it is now. I don't, and, and a big message, a big story that I wanted my students to tell themselves was it doesn't matter whether I know it now, it matters whether I know it in May, and usually like May of 2025 would be nice, right? So the fact is, is that the fact that you don't know it now is just an opportunity to figure out how it works. And since everything we teach in this class sort of goes together, we're lucky as physicists that way. Um, let's keep working on this idea. Like it'll keep coming up in the class. It all is combined together. So don't worry about it if you don't know it now, figure it out later. And, and that actually helped a lot of conversations in my class become, instead of why did I get four and a half out of five instead of five out of five on this question, it became, how do I do this better next time? Okay. And I would just quickly like to make a comment that this is exactly the reason why I want, why I changed my assessment because my TAs will be working so hard to provide all this feedback and the student would not even look at it and then repeat the same mistake in a lab report next week. And my TAs were getting, you know, some of them getting depressed saying, what, what am I doing this, you know? And so uh, this is where Eric's talk, when he showed how by accident, he didn't have, uh, you know, things to, the, the reports giving back weren't marked. He was expected they were marked, they weren't. And then he gave students printed and students started looking at each other and said, oh, how you done that? How you done that? And he realized, oh, that's the way to do it. 
And so this is why um, assessment and feedback are intertwined. You can't, you know, assessment for assessment purposes doesn't lead to learning. You have to have feedback on it. So this is why I done sort of uh, this, this approach, we're having this uh, two feedbacks. One is from the example that we give them. So they have to, it's more intermediate because otherwise it will take a week for us to mark, but they get it in two days. And then you, you test then with this second step, you test whether they understood their mistake. And if they did, they will remember forever, right? They, they, they don't have to practice or study anymore. So this is why um, if you can find a way to somehow have that self-feedback in between before you give them then your final feedback or final assessment, that will force them to start appreciating the feedback. And this is what I what I found out from you know, my students that they actually started, and that's what we call metacognition. Are you able to figure out your own learning process and, and take ownership of it? And that's... I believe Shannon could add uh, something because okay. Shannon was active on, on the chat uh, about this topic. So could you share with us your thoughts? And somebody yeah, else? Yeah, a couple, yeah, a couple of things. One is, when, when I had physical students in front of me with physical papers, I would like highlight mistakes, um, like with just a highlighter and um, it was super fast. I didn't have to write any comments, but it, it, then I didn't put a grade on the paper. Um, and then I, as a whole class, we went over some of my favorite mistakes. And so I tried to like honor students' mistakes in that way is like, this isn't a bad thing, but it's my favorite mistake because it's the best learning moment here. Like, you know, a bunch of people made this mistake or, you know, it really highlights a conceptual misunderstanding. Um, and sometimes students would like, at the beginning of the year, especially be like, oh, whatever. <laughs> I know, my but, students would freak out if I did that. <laughs> Yeah, but um, they, they eventually get used to it. Um, and then just another thing I wanted to know is I use PowerSchool too, and and also kind of like I rescaled my my courses, which is might have been what you did. So like the lowest grade for in a like standard based grading way as best I could in standardized PowerSchool um, was like a 50%. And so that was if you demonstrated no evidence of mastery. And so the lowest score someone had is a 50%. And then I could scale up from there. It, it's not perfect, but it was a way to like, work within the power school system. But what I mean is before I finally transitioned to the power school standards based grading schema, which I know is there, I just haven't had an opportunity to look at it. Um, still using the traditional grading tools in power school, how to how to give a, a standards based grade in power school that's meaningful to the both the kids and myself. Yeah, I have worked done like a workaround and I'm happy to chat at some point uh, about it. I don't think the yeah. technical details is probably the best use of our time. A right workaround now. is what I'm looking for at the moment. <laughs> yep. A crutch until I until my leg finishes healing. Yeah. If you guys <laughs> you might just, let sorry Thank guys, you. I don't mean to jump in, nice. but um yeah, yeah, one, sure. one uh -huh. thing you can do is um you could change the grade and you can instead of putting assignments in, put standards in. So you just list the standards of what they're being assessed on. And then you give them a, a score of zero to 10 or five to 10 or however you're going to scale it and just allow them to resubmit the item that addresses that standard. So you can then give the grade you want to give for mastery for that. Mm -hmm. That would be at a workaround in power school. Helen. Sorry. Uh, at the risk of opening an enormous can of worms, um, my students can correct every single piece of work for 100% credit 100% of the time. Now, I know a lot of people that do that, and it's quite gobsmacking to me that they don't all have A's, but they don't all have A's. Isn't that amazing? I mean, um, I think as time goes on, gradually the higher and higher percentage will get A's because, you know, what are you going to do? But uh, grading is a really, um, it's an interesting thing, and it does, as I said in the chat, it, the assessment does, uh, have a disproportionate effect on classroom practice, unfortunately, and it's a bit like the tail wagging the dog, and it would be nice to do something about that if we could join together and do that. Okay, and Craig, do you want to add anything or you no, just- that's what I forgot. wanted to add. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, any other questions we have? 
I just want to Ma ask you. Maksuda and okay, Yasmina, and then Maksuda ask the question, the second question. Okay, Yasmina, please. I just want to mention that the assessment that I, that I talked about in my video is basically on lab reports, which you know used to be the easiest thing to pass, but now they become you know something difficult and meaningful. Not difficult by purpose, but by difficult because you, they have to think through. And uh, I couldn't change the, the exam. Exam st still had to stay, which is forty percent of the total mark. Um, and because the, we teach this unit together with uh, our Malaysia campus, and they had a professor there who had been teaching that for 20 years. He's excellent. He always has high ratings. He's great. His students are performing well. When I introduced this, my students, for the first time, we have to give the same test. Everything else is different, but we have to give the same exam. It, for the first time, my students overperformed over his brilliant students. And so to me, that was. Uh, a, um, showing that it's, they're really learning how to learn. They're really understanding physics enough to pass the standardized you know, exam. And so this is where I think if we teach students how to learn and get that passion to reach certain level, then they can do any standardized tests or, you know, and so that uh, learning to test is not meant to be bad to, to some extent. But if a teacher only gives physics students formulas and makes them do 3000 problems without understanding what they're doing, but just grabbing a formula, quickly calculating, to me, that's teaching to the test, right? Because you just, mm -hmm. you're trying to get kind of drill going into them without understanding physics. But if you teach them to understand physics, then they can do any any type of test well because they understand basic principles. I think. Okay, Maksuda, and then Robert Krakel. Maksuda, okay. Um, I'm going to change the topic a little bit, if that's okay. So we also talked about um, from novice to tenure teaching, right? So my question is, all of us who are here, we're probably like what 80 people here. It's summer, it's vacation on our own time, so we're all already passionate about teaching, about making a difference, right? For many school districts, all teachers, like all of us here, plus the teachers who are not here, who will do an eight to four, just walk in, sit behind the desk and leave, are going to get the same pay, same everything, right? Um, how do you make sure a new teacher coming in doesn't fall into that category? Like I was this year training teachers and one of the questions they asked me is like, I see you working 12 hours and this teacher's working seven hours you get the same pay, why would I want to overwhelm myself, right? So and again, active teaching is, active learning teaching is just difficult, right? It's easy to just pick up a worksheet, give it to the students, especially for our school district where the lesson plan is done for us, right? So how would you get a novice teacher and try to tell them that, hey, yes, we get the same salary, yes, we don't get any extra benefits or anything else and motivate them enough while dealing with difficult students, because we teach a Title I school where there's a fight almost the same every day, how do you make sure that majority teachers want to become like the school, let's say? Maxuda, I, I've asked myself the question, why am I sitting here? This same moment, why am I sitting here? And it's, it's not going to give me anything more than just going back to the classroom and teaching my students and, and, and interacting with my students a little bit better. And I, I want to go back to that dopamine. Dopamine changed my life because it made me understand why I am the teacher that I am. In the end, for me, um, the end result that makes me close my classroom door at the end of the day is not the money in my pocket. It's that feeling that, oh, my students really got it. Um, that is what keeps me teaching. And maybe that is, that is a little, my advice always to the new teachers that come in is you're not teaching for the money, you're teaching for that, um, you're teaching for the kids and you're making them enjoy it. But that becomes difficult to do if, um, as I said, like if everybody's getting the same, right? Like without an insight, without, I agree with you, I absolutely agree with you, but there's an external incentive often that's required, right? If you're an underfunded school and you're, as a fighting fights every second moment, um, Tyree's coming into your classroom, whereas you don't have to put in all that effort and you're yeah, so I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to address that because I taught in inner city New Orleans and I taught in inner city um, Seattle. So I've had, yeah, I've had students who tried to break into our school just so they could learn from other schools. Um, so you teach, it's especially important to teach well 
in schools where students do not have access to resources, it becomes an equity issue and you become an equity warrior in order to serve your students. And what it means to be an equity warrior is not necessarily to do more work, but to do purposeful work and to try to understand how you can really become such a great instructor that you can do that in seven hours. And you can, if you're very purposeful and you're really working on building out that conceptual model in student, you will find that you have more time than you think you have. And part of the issue is that we're often and our curriculum is extremely disorganized and there's way too much of it because big books sell. And so how do we become purposeful for our students? And I will tell you as an educator who has been in the field for a very long time, I still get emails from uh, like former gangsters that I used to teach who talk about how much they love my class because they felt empowered. And so did, were they ever physicists? No. But were they empowered and able to make better choices in their life? Yes. So become an equity warrior and don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Just try to improve what you're doing for your student. But how do you spread that? That's, I guess, my question. You don't spread it. People have to come to it, right? People come to it or they don't come to it. It's not, you know, you're, you can be an evangelist. Like I'm a modeling evangelist. I love modeling. But like, I'm not going to hold somebody down and try to make them be a good teacher, right? They Eventually, they're going to get sick of it and they're going to leave, right? I believe Helen is, uh, wants to add anything to that. Also, oh, sorry. Robert, I did not forget about you, but Helen Robert, wants to uh, resonate properly on that. Yeah. Well, you no, know, just to say on that, that, you know, uh, looking at international models of this as well, um, I, I had a little hiatus where I helped um, go into schools to help teachers who were being dumped on to teach physics who didn't have a physics background and they suddenly had to teach like high school physics and they were biologists or, or even like, I wouldn't, shouldn't say even, gosh, terrible geologists. Um, and uh, so it is possible. And that model was brilliant because it was, I went to them. I had a region and I went to their school. After school, we had some tea and biscuits and we talked about forces. Then we, a few months later, we had tea and biscuits and we talked about electricity and they came along with their problems. I showed them model, models and modeling and how you do it, how you do misconceptions. And so there is the two parts of the piece here. There's whether you put on this PD where the teachers elect to go or get sent by the school or get sent by the district. But there's also a different model. There is another model where groups of physics teachers who, you know, know their stuff, basically adopt a school or a group of schools, just go in and say, you know, let me talk to you about the fundamental we did forces electricity and energy we then did like magnetism electromagnetism waves and space and stuff extra but the core business was that i talked to middle school teachers and high school teachers nearly well all of them didn't have a physics background and what i learned was i didn't meet a single teacher who did not want to get better every single person wanted to do it better and what was holding them up was their fear because they didn't want the kiddo to ask them a question they couldn't answer. And so I just said, give me all the questions you think, you know, the kids are gonna, and let me tell you some of the ones they're gonna ask you as well because they're bonkers, they have like strange ideas. Um, so that there is that model. I'd love for the APT, APS people have a little bit of, you know, money to pay for the biscuits. So we could go in and do that kind of work with people and respond to the need on the ground. But it is a very, I don't know if it's a different model. It is a, a quite a common model in the, in the UK. And I'm sure there are different models in Portugal and Poland and various different places. Let's get those ideas together and do something. Okay, Robert, thank you for your patience. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I'll make it quick because I know uh, we can continue this conversation in spatial uh, chat. Yeah. Um, but two quick things. Um, one, I believe, Nancy, you were speaking about the, the teachers who don't want to improve will leave. And I don't necessarily know if that's true. Um, I know a lot of physics teachers who are putting in their time. They got their tenure. They're making 150 k and they've been doing nothing for 25 years. And they're going to continue to do that until they can hit their pension. Um, at least in New York. So that might be true in some places because I know salary differentials and stuff like that um, vary greatly state by state and country by country. 
Um, but at least where I am, I, that's, that's an issue, a very prevalent issue. Um, and actually to build off what Maxuda was saying, uh, the question that I really have is for the teachers that are going in um, that are the only physics teacher, they're taking over a program and they're not teaching only physics, right? More likely than not, they're going to fall back on however they were taught, which more than likely was lecture and textbook because that's what they got. Here's the textbook, make the kids pass. Um, you all have lots of ideas. Um, if you were presented with one of these, you know, new teachers and it was like, hey, you're going to be their mentor for a week. Teach them everything you can because that's the only time you're going to get with them, right? Or even this five minutes. Um, what would you say to them? And I know, Helen, we spoke about this before and Elmarie, we've spoken about this and Dagmara. So like, what would you say? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Oh I, I say to my lecturers, invest time in the beginning and that pays off dividends later on because uh, I find active teaching approaches much more pleasurable. I almost left academia because I was so bored of having 400 faces just looking at me and like two students at the front talking to me. And then we just end up building these beautiful uh, studios like Scale Up from North Carolina. And then I could talk to 100 students and, and, and you know, get to know them as people so I then I bring my new colleagues they watch me for a week and they go oh this is not as, as scary or difficult as you know I imagine it to be so I always say to them invest the time properly now in your first year set things up and then you won't have to prepare ever again you will just be walking in the classroom because you're talking to students you don't have to preach your powerpoints and you know worry about this um you you actually talk to students and and we have colleagues who really said oh I thought teaching is a boring job but but I love it now because you know I'm talking to students I have I have I see the effect of my work by having students talking back to me so so that would be my message invest the time at the start it pays dividends I, I would like to say two things very quickly I know I don't usually but I will try um <laughs> read Daniel Willingham's book why don't students like school if I had read that 32 years ago oh my gosh because cognitive load theory is something every single teacher should know it's going to make your life like a gazillion times easier secondly join twitter i was a twitter phobe for years and i really missed out there are some brilliant people with some fantastic ideas you learn a lot it's continuous free pd michael and, and the third thing i would add is don't spend a lot of time. I'd actually go the opposite way. I'd say don't spend a lot of time your first year. Your first year is about do whatever you can to get through that lesson and make yourself comments on what you want to do better. If you're being given physics and bio and chemistry, your first year teaching, to put yourself up to a level where you're going to feel like you have these interactions with students is untenable and it's going to set you up for failure. Your job at that point is to make connections with the kids and do something that's related to your content and build on that next year. What I found is the most, the thing that has kept me interested is that I get one or 2% better about something I can actually point at every year. And it doesn't have to be everything, um, but knowing that I can point to something, this is what I worked on this year and I can tell how I do it better, has kept me interested for 25 years. And Fabienne, and probably that will be the end of the session. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Well, I would say that every beginning, uh, yes, every beginning is difficult, but I think that if the teacher overcomes the initial fear and anxiety of applying the, the new methodology of active learning, I, I'm sure that he or she will succeed. So be brave. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Eric, are we about to finish? Is that... Yes, right I, yes, unfortunately, yes, I, because I, I we're, think, we're, yeah, I agree, we could continue for hours. I know, uh, I know. Thank you so much, all the panelists. Thank you so much for all the presentations and this vivid, vivid discussion and the audience for what, what was happening on the chat. Well, we didn't uh, even have uh, time to look at that. But anyway, Everybody can save a chat. I'm not sure if you know that, but everybody can do that right now. Not not the not only the host. So you can 
save the chat and read later on. Okay, we continue to the uh, to this uh, to this other room, right, Eric? Yes, yes, and 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 before we do, I want to thank everyone because I know that not everybody will go to spatial chat. So I, I, this sort of of ends the official part of this NSF. Pulse Network Summer Conference. I think it was just fantastic to see the engagement. I want to thank the speakers, the moderators, the panelists for their contribution, and everyone really in the audience for being so incredibly engaged in the chat and uh, and and also by by asking many questions. So thank you all so much. We will now transfer to spatial chat. Those of you who did not get a chance to try this out uh, in uh, one of the first two days, uh, the link will be in the chat here in a moment. And, uh, and I think one of us will stay behind in this space so that if you try to get on, but you can't get on, you can always come back here to ask for, um, for help. So thank you all so much. And, um, you know, congratulations to all for making this such a, a phenomenal, phenomenally exciting uh, opportunity to meet and mingle and, and interact and exchange ideas. I look forward to uh, the next year where we can build on what we have started uh, this year. Enjoy a well-deserved summer break. Be well. And if we don't see each other in a minute in spatial chat, we'll see each other in the fall when we resume our activities. Thank you. Bye-bye.